And so we are coming for the next and last speaker of this session. Mikolai is going to present on a topic which, as far as I remember, has never been covered at a, at the Rise Summit. Um, it's about um, payments um, in IoT systems. And um, Nikolai is a PhD student at um, TU Dresden, so also working with um, Matthias and his group. Martin Oster. Heck to get this the windows far away. Okay, <laughs> technical issues this fixed. Let's welcome Nikolai. Okay, so uh, now that we've talked about time and uh, about consistency and distributed systems, uh, let's talk about money. Let's talk about uh, payments and payments in the IoT. Um, so I guess uh, this is nothing really new for you. Uh, for all of you that are here and have been here for the last two days at least. Uh, the Internet of Things um, uh, is a big, like, is a big name. Uh, it can mean a lot of things, um, but, uh, and there's a lot of different applications uh, in there. So it comes, like, I'm, I'm just gonna give some examples here. Uh, uh, some, some environments where you have some sensors deployed uh, on your agriculture fields. Um, and then you maybe automatically want to um, uh, pour water uh, on them if they need it. Um, you have uh, applications like Smart Factory where you want to have warehouse, uh, um, uh, yeah, have an overview of your, of your inventory and uh, maybe organize that um, to get uh, to get new supply. Um, you could uh, have some form of uh, logis logistics that's uh, organized by IoT devices uh, or, or where IoT devices play a role um, in, in orchestrating. Uh, smart city, um, this whole part of having smart infrastructure that communicates with uh, vehicles, vehicles communicating with each other. Um, the smart home appliance, uh, uh, applications, um, some smart devices at your home that communicate to, um, uh, for example, a warehouse to, to order new supply for your, um, for your fridge, um, or smart grid applications where in your neighborhood you maybe want to coordinate uh, energy um, production and, and, and usage in a smart way. So in a lot of those cases, you actually have uh, different actors involved. Um, so usually the, uh, whatever, the, the owner of the gas station um, is, not, is maybe not the owner of the, uh, of the truck that's bringing uh, the apple to your, to your fridge. So there is some, some form of distributed economy um, and a lot of the data that is uh, actually handled and, that, and, and things that are being paid for may be privacy sensitive um, in the sense that maybe you don't want to know uh, um, or you don't want other people to know what, what you are buying uh, for your fridge or um, that you are actually watering your plants right now uh, in, that, in that very moment. And uh, as you all know, all these pictures are nice, but in the end, it's more like this. You have a bunch of computers everywhere, um, bigger or smaller, but a lot of them um, will actually be microcontrollers. Um, so then you actually want to have some kind of value transfer between these uh, devices. Um, and you probably want it to be autonomous uh, and, not, uh, and, and not be... Uh, uh, like ha have the necessity to to manually uh, transfer transfer money um, to to get these things working. So we have the distributed economy, and we need uh, some form of uh, payments between machines. So in this uh, talk today, I'm going to um, talk a bit about uh, payments in the IoT. Uh, I already gave a little motivation. Um, 
short part about uh, what IoT means. That's also not something really new to, to this community. Um, then I'm going to go a bit about, like, um, through some, some different forms of payment systems and which of them uh, could be suitable for the IoT. Um, then I'm going to present an eCash scheme, or that's one form of a digital payment system um, that I've been working with, um, and in the end give some um, yeah, general remarks on what, what actually having uh, these payment systems deployed with IoT devices means, what kind of challenges you can face, and, and uh, what kind of solutions we envision. So, IoT, uh, as said, there's high-end IoT stuff, there's big uh, computers, or rather big computers, that's like, like the Raspberry Pi, um, and then there's the low-end and, and constrained IoT, and uh, I mean, we're here at the right summit, and um, as said before, there is um, a lot of IoT devices that would actually be quite small. Um, so we look at the uh, interesting type of classes, uh, ty type of devices, the uh, constraint IoT. So as you all know, constraints in uh, price, in uh, processing power, in memory that you have available, in energy that you have available, and there were also a networking uh, stack that you, that you may have available. And you also all know that there's uh, quite a high uh, heterogeneity of devices in this, in this field. It's not just uh, Intel and ARM uh, and uh, CPUs, um, but, but, but much more out there. Um, so first of all, the IoT puts an uh, important requirement on a payment system, namely that it's uh, um, yeah, feasible to be supported in such a system. So the resource demands should not be uh, too high. As said before, we want a system that can work autonomously uh, without human intervention. We want a privacy-preserving system because there's uh, metadata involved that uh, um, yeah, maybe important to protect, um, especially if you want these on-the-go payment uh, scenarios. Um, in a lot of cases, you also want to be able to support quite uh, small amounts of payments. Um, so basically, have low fees, uh, even if you transfer a fraction of a cent, maybe. Um, and you want a high number of payments, and you also want to be uh, able to be sure that the payment was actually su has actually succeeded, um, so you want a fast settlement. And one option would maybe be use some traditional payment systems, uh, whatever, credit card, um, third-party payment provider like PayPal, um, some national systems. There's a lot of the out there. Um, they are account-based, so basically you just need some kind of identity identifier, some kind of authentication uh, me method. So on, that, on, on the side of resource demands, they're really very convenient. Like there's, um, there's not, not, not much you need to, to do as a, as a device, and you can, I mean, you have the credit cards already. That's uh, like basically um, uh, small. IoT devices, uh, if you want uh, to, to be like that, um, that can well perform the task. Um, but on the other hand, they don't really work autonomously. You have some uh, accounts that are identity bound. You maybe don't really want to trust your IoT system to store your credit card credentials. Um, um, because of these accounts, it's also uh, not really privacy-preserving uh, privacy preserving system. Um, you have, uh, well, the central server, the central uh, payment service provider uh, that can look at all people's account and basically see where money is transferred from and to and maybe for what purpose. Um, and usually you also have quite high fees uh, if, you, if you go down to, to smaller amounts that you want to pay. Settlement, uh, 
most of the times it's kind of instant or at least you get a confirmation and then it's a liability of the payment uh, service provider that the payment is actually succeeded. So on the other end of the spectrum, um, what some people might think of if they hear um, payments in, in IoT, um, cryptocurrencies. So here it's kind of the other uh, coin or the other side of the coin. Um, you have, uh, well, you, you can quite easily achieve autonomy because you have some, I mean, you just open some account on the blockchain and then you have your uh, funds there and you can have several of them um, and you can give one IoT device one or however you want to distribute. Um, on the side of privacy, you have pseudonymity at least. Um, um, but on the other hand, uh, if you really want to be part of the blockchain and uh, verify uh, that your payments went through and that there's no one cheating on you, um, you have to perform quite extensive, uh, expensive verification. Um, you need a lot of data as well that you that, that you need to check uh, the state of the cur the current state of the blockchain. And in terms of micropayments and and settlements, uh, well, micropayments you have quite high mining fees uh, usually, so transaction are, transactions are expensive. Um, to the extent that right now, I mean, no one really uses the blockchain anymore itself, but then some uh, layer on top that um, uh, only uses the blockchain underneath and gives some other um, um, uh, some other guarantees. And uh, the settlement is uh, is also not instant. So. Obviously, what I'm going to talk about uh, has a lot more green check marks. Uh, Gnutale is a system that uh, is a free software. Um, it's basically a payment uh, service protocol with a free software reference implementation. Um, it works uh, as or it works using the, using the eCash scheme. I'm going to give some, some more uh, details on that uh, in the upcoming slides. Um, it provides uh, privacy guarantees to the payer uh, of, of whichever transaction, um, thanks to blind, th blind signatures. Uh, it allows for autonomy because you basically hold some kind of token, such as you, like, just as you would uh, hold coins or, or bills in your in your physical wallet um, and you can just give some some of those tokens to to your IoT devices and then they can pay with it uh, without any more uh, further intervention um, micropayments um, at least they claim that the operational costs are quite low and because of the self custody they also don't have uh, like high extra costs to secure aut uh, authentication of their account-based system because there's no accounts. Um, and uh, settlement uh, can be instant as soon as you get uh, some token. You can check if that's valid and if it is, then uh, you're good to go. Um, resource demands, that's basically the part that is still uh, under investigation. So that's uh, what I'm looking at, if it's possible to bring this system uh, on IoT devices. So, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm going to give a, a short introduction into how Gnutale itself works. Um, so it's not uh, trying to be a new currency or a new type of value like cryptocurrency are, like store of, store of value but it's just a payment system. So you have some kind of currency um, and you can represent that in this uh, payment system and pay with it. Just like in PayPal, you don't pay with uh, some, some new currency, but you pay with euro or, or dollar. And same here, you would use a, a real currency. Um, as said, there's anonymity for the payer. Um, whenever you spend tokens or, or here I call them coins um, 
you you can or the, neither the central service provider, which is called Exchange here, uh, nor the mer merchant can tell who you are. Um, and also, if you have several payments, they are unlinkable. So unlike with an account-based system, where it's just basically enough to see where the uh, money is coming from and then um, um, yeah, link these payments together. Every token is distinct, um, and you cannot uh, you cannot trace them back. On the other hand, um, I, I emphasized on the anonymity for the payer because on the other side, if you receive money, um, the system has built in um, income transparency, which means that uh, you basically uh, or it is known to the system, uh, the ident your identity is known to the system whenever you receive, uh, receive money and that's uh, basically for legal purposes or to enable um, operation in, in a legal framework um, where you have yeah, uh, requirements such as um, where taxation that you want to ensure. Um, yeah. One special or one important thing about this whole system, it's online only, so you need some form of connectivity to the rest of the system. Um, and that's, well, basically to prevent double spending because if uh, no one is connected, then I could give you a token and then I could go to the other side of the room and give them the same token again and you would not know that uh, that, that, that one of them is basically not valid anymore because it has already been spent. So we have these three uh, different uh, actors or these three different components in the system. Uh, the exchange is, a central, is the central service provider um, that, uh, well, is the central authorities. That one holds the actual value um, that it gives out in, in tokens and it gives back the value to the one who um, deposits the token, uh, so in that case the merchant. The wallet uh, is the one that, uh, well, has the tokens in the first place and will be the payer in, in some uh, transaction. Um, and the merchant uh, receives the, the payment and uh, forwards it to, ex to the exchange to check that the coin is valid that was paid with. So basically there are four different uh, basic interactions between those um, components. At some point you need to get the tokens from the exchange as a wallet. Uh, then you can pay with them. Uh, the merchant will deposit them uh, at the exchange. and. Uh, the, the extra action, the refresh action, is to ensure unlinkable payments. So if you pay with a token and there's some, um, uh, maybe, maybe you have to pay for, for one euro and you give a coin for two euros and then uh, you want to refresh the, the remaining value of one euro to get a new token of it so that further payments cannot be linked. Um, and on a cryptographical, uh, from the like cryptographic perspective, um, as said, the withdrawal uh, uses blind signatures. So the the coin itself is just a normal um, elliptic curve uh, uh, key pair, and for the, uh, the the signature that makes the coin valid. Um, the RSA full domain ha hash uh, blinding scheme is used. Um, and whenever you pay with the coin, you actually prove the ownership of the coin by using the private key of, of, of that key pair. So as you can see, there's, uh, well, some cryptogra cryptography involved and mostly the uh, withdrawal part and the RSA, RSA um, as you can imagine, uh, is um, well a challenge for IoT devices in terms of the memory that you need to store the to store the signatures, in terms of um, well the uh, the CPU uh, power that you need to verify the signatures. 
Um, yeah, and then there's some HKDF involved as well, but that's not really a huge deal. Okay, so if we envision uh, having payments on in the IoT, then we would envision to have a wallet. Basically, we don't want to build a server, obviously, and um, also the merchant is much simpler because it basically just relays the token that it gets um, to the exchange and then needs some some form of uh, well tracking um, or keeping track of, of of what it has received. But the wallet is actually the interesting part. Um, and for the wallet, there's three basic operations that you need to support. You need to store the coins, which means the, these key pairs uh, with, the, with, with the signatures. You need to be able to perform some cryptographic operations, basically the one that I just saw earlier. Um, and you need to be able to somehow uh, access the internet to communicate with these other components. And obviously, if you want to bring this to an IoT device, uh, there's the resource constraints uh, on top that you need to take care of. Um, and now I'm going to give a quick, well, outlook on, on what is already there and what is envisioned for, these, uh, for, for this IoT wallet. So uh, as said, the, the storage is, or you have limited storage on such systems. Um, so the idea here is to minimize the amount that you actually want to store with some uh, kind of intelligent coin selection strategy. So, uh, I mean, you can easily imagine that you have a scenario where you could pay a two euro, uh, you, could, you could pay two euro with two tokens of each one euro or maybe with one token of four euros and then get one, uh, two euros back. Um, and there's always this kind of, uh, or, or in, in, many, in many cases, you have to decide on which is the best one. And uh, especially for the IT uh, use case, it's important to keep the amount of um, tokens that you currently have uh, low. Um, the cryptographic operations, um, hardware acceleration is obviously the, the way to go, especially for things such as uh, RSA. Um, and uh, it's also important to, to, to look into being able to maybe use different ciphers uh, or di different, different algorithms uh, in the case that your device for some reason doesn't uh, nicely support RSA. And uh, on the network access um, where you have, well, these low power uh, network protocols, limited payload sizes, sizes and, and limited bandwidth. Um, you, we, we propose to use uh, CBOR for, for the data format uh, and co-op for, for the application protocol uh, instead of the JSON and HTTP stack that is usually used in, um, in, in, in Tala. And at some point, obviously, if you have these IoT devices and they maybe don't have the suitable uh, physical layer to directly connect to uh, the internet, you need some form of a gateway. Um, and that's actually the next slide I'm going to talk about. That, um, and yeah, if you have these, uh, this high hardware heterogeneity, it's obviously nice to have some kind of general purpose IoT operating system that abstracts that away from you. And, well, Riot is a nice example of that. Um, so one last thing in the system design, I kind of lied to you because that's probably not how it's going to work. Uh, you will need some kind of gateway in between, uh, which basically translates uh, the, the, the physical layer, at least, um, um, of, of the requests and, and responses. Uh, the communication that the wallet has with the exchange and the merchant. And what we have right now is, uh, well, the first prototype of uh, a, a wallet uh, built with Riot um, using 8.215.4 uh, as, a, as a physical layer. Um, it's the well-known NRF52840. Um, 
some UI and, uh, and input output uh, connected for, for demo, demo purposes. And the, the payment support, support for payment is already there. So basically these um, elliptic curve uh, signatures um, using the, the PSA crypto API. Um, and then there's some, some form of IoT gateway in that case can be a Raspberry Pi that talks 802.15.4 as well or a laptop um, and then some, some form of proxy that translates between CBOR, uh, JSON, uh, CBOR and JSON and, and Coop and HTTP on the other side. And if you want, uh, I have it with me and I will probably have it around for the hackathon. Not sure if I'm going to work on it, but uh, it will be there. So if you, if you want to see it live, then just hit me up tomorrow. Okay, with that, uh, come to the conclusions. Um, I talked about the necessity why uh, IoT or digital payments are um, interesting for the future of uh, an IoT uh, economy. Um, I talked about the requirements. Uh, I showed the, the eCash as a possible solution. I talked about the constraint that the uh, IoT puts on uh, such a wallet and, um, well, just briefly introduced the prototype that is uh, here tomorrow. With that, thank you for the attention. Thank you, Mikolai. Are there questions? Um, could you go uh, back to, I think it was slide 10, where you showed, where you transitioned from the IoT scenario um, to the money flow, right, this one. Um, so what was not clear to me was, um, like I understand uh, why you want to use Knutala, um, but, the, but your thought process from uh, slide nine to slide 10 wasn't obvious to me because, um, for example, if I use um, network access authentication, I, I, in, in some sense, the exchange is, of course, between me, the local provider, and potentially my home provider, but the money flow is from my bank account uh, to the network provider. And there's a little bit of it is shared back to the visited network provider, this in a cellular environment. Um, but in the transition from this slide to the other one, it seems that the money flow uh, comes from the device all the way over there, which is, um, which of course then puts an additional burden on, on, of course, on the device and the nodes and networks where it's in the, in the other model, it, that's not really needed. And so I wonder, like, in what cases would the would you have IoT devices where you really need to have the money flow literally coming from the IoT device? Uh, and I also want to avoid that my IoT lamp uh, coffee machine is suddenly spending all my money, uh, hard-earned money from the university, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not going to uh, spend all your money. It's <laughs> at most spending the money that you put on it in the first place. Okay. Right? Uh, that's, the, that's the difference to just putting your credit card details in your coffee machine. Uh, um, and uh, the other part of the question, um, I mean, the, the uh, upside is that uh, you don't really have to interfere anymore with the payment process. You just say, okay, you, my coffee machine gets this amount of money and then it makes sure that uh, I always have the coffee that I need. Um, and. Uh, on, on the other side, the, 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 the one that you're paying or, or the, the coffee um, distributor uh, that doesn't need to have, take account of how much you, um, um, how much coffee you, you drank in that, in that month or, or whatever, um, um, because, well, basically for, e for each and every um, um, coffee, uh, Delivery that you get, you would you would directly pay, and neither the distributor or especially the distributor doesn't have to care um, 
who uh, who this um, uh, who paid actually for for this for this coffee? Okay. So how's the how's the performance hit then for the IoT device? Like in your in your implementation, if I use that Nutella sort of exchanges, is it is it bad? <laughs> uh, what do you mean? The performance impact. Uh, so I'm, I'm, we're, I'm not yet at the point where I can, where I can say for the whole uh, system how it would perform. The payment signatures that are there, they are pretty cheap, but that's not really a big surprise if it's elliptic curves uh, and there's some hardware support for it. Um, so yeah, right now I, I, cannot really, I cannot really answer that question. Maybe I missed it. So, um, h how do you verify that if I like I can sit down, generate a new elliptic curve key pair? Um, h how do you make sure that the system actually knows that this this particular key pair a key pair is money and this particular key pair is nonsense? Um, yeah. And maybe the other question is how do you make sure that the wallet who sends money actually is deleting its private key? Sorry, how like if you if you send wallet, from what I understand, is that you basically send the private key to the other instance. No, actually not, uh, because then uh, as soon as you sh uh, send the private key, then both of you have the private key, right? So I mean, you, in, in theory, c you can do that, but then it's basically shared ownership of the same money. Yeah. yeah. Um, the way. Or, or let's go with the first question. The, the first question first. Maybe I slipped over it before. So really, you as a wallet, you create a key pair. Then you go to the exchange, say, "Hey, I want a new. I want. I, I want money. I transfer you the money in some other way." Um, the exchange gets that money and then signs your key pair. And, and the nice thing about this is that it's using blind signatures, so, so the exchange later cannot tell that it gave this signature to you or this, this signed coin back to you. Um, but it just sees, oh, this is a coin that has a valid signature that was issued by me and has not been spent yet, so it's a valid coin. So that's the first part. And the second part, um, the payment is actually that, that you um, I mean, you, you send the uh, public key with, together with the signature of the exchange and you sign this whole uh, data with a private key. So you prove that uh, you have the signature of the exchange and you are the, the one that owns the, the coin by knowing the private key. A brief follow-up question on, on, the, on that blinding. Um, what is keeping the exchange from sharding itself so that when I request something into a wallet with my authorization, with my payment, um, that it then creates one identity that does this blind signatures for all my coins, um, and, but uses another identity for, for signing someone else's coins? So is, is, is there some, like, tr uh, something like certificate transparency, something like that, that verifies that this signature blinding is actually effective? Um. So I mean, you 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 know the uh, every every or let's uh, uh, so so there's there's different uh, values in like different types of coins. They have different values, and each of those has a certain uh, public private key that is used for signing, um, and you can know those. So you know the public keys. Um, and then if you get the signature, you see if that is actually the right signature to the, to the um, public key that you know for that very de denomination. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Partially, but I think for the gaps, I'd really have to read up on, that, on, that, on the particular blind signature signing scheme. Uh, and then, I mean, there is, uh, this image is a bit simplified. There is some other components that are also provided um, or thought of in, in the overall system, like an auditor. Um, because right now, it's true that you kind of have to trust the exchange uh, also to not uh, just say, okay, this coin is invalid because I 
for some reason I say it, it was already spent but it was but never spent and then you basically um, cannot do anything if you have just this scheme but then there's some external auditor which uh, in theory should be run by some otherwise trusted entity like some state authority or something um, and then there are well cryptographic uh, steps as well involved in the whole process to make sure that the auditor can check if it's v if it's true that the exchange actually um, lied or not. Thank you. And, and a very short question. I've seen online that a lot of going on around like what they call NGI Tala now, um, possibly also in cooperation with banks and possibly like the EZB um, electronic euro part. How, can you place that a bit in relationship with each other? Yeah. So there's the NGI Tala project uh, started beginning of this year. Um, it's basically of a, co a consortium of Tala systems, which is basically people behind GNU Thaler together with some banks. There's a uh, Hungarian bank, there's GLS bank uh, in Germany, uh, some uh, digital rights uh, uh, NG, NG, NGOs. Um, uh, and their goal is to provide or like offer GNU Thaler as a payments uh, option um, well, at least in Germany and Hungary, but uh, um, in theory, if uh, if you have it in Germany and it's just with IBAN and, and Euro, then you could use it somewhere else as, as long as someone accept, uh, accepts your tokens. Um, so that, that project uh, will go on for three years. Um, and there's also some, some extra funds available if uh, someone here maybe is uh, interested in applying in some way contributing to to GNU Thaler and, and this whole project uh, there's there's open calls like rolling on a rolling basis um, but it's not so it's NGI so it's EU funds but it's not uh, connected with the uh, European Central Bank so their digital euro project is kind of separate. So th this could be a solution that uh, would nicely, uh, probably nicely work for uh, such thing like a digital euro, but uh, in the in the sole procurement uh, process uh, of the digital euro, Tala uh, is currently at least not uh, one of the candidates. No, uh, sorry, I think uh, uh, we have to, to, to Cut it and take it to the coffee break now. Okay. Because uh, we, we're already like 25 minutes behind schedule. Um, and uh, yeah, so thanks again to Mikolai and um, all the other speakers. <laughs> <laughs>